Okay, welcome back. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes? Yes, sister. Okay. So, uh, we are looking at how the Holy Spirit is our director in kingdom building, how he directs us, uh, leads us, and teaches us. Um, so, we know that even as we are praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you know, prepares us to understand the purpose plans and the purposes of uh, God, just like um, uh, Asapu had mentioned, you know, praying in the spirit. Uh, so look at what 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9, 10 and 16 uh, says. Sagetro, do you want to read that? Yes, yeah, sister. Yes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 10 and 16. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Gertrude. So um, it is a, you know, even as God's plan and purpose for us is something that is a mystery to us, uh, you know, we don't know it, but it's the Holy Spirit who reveals these mysteries to us. Everything that ha God has planned for those who love him, which he has planned even before the foundations of the world, even before you and I were conceived in our mother's womb, he had plans for us. And it's the Holy Spirit who reveals these mysteries to uh, us and when the Holy Spirit reveals the plan, the purposes of God to us, you know, we can then say that we have the mind of Christ. How can we say that we have the mind of Christ when we know the thoughts, the plans, and the purposes that He has for us? We can say that we have the mind of Christ. That means we have His mind because He has revealed His mind uh, to us by His. Uh, spirit okay and um, even as we pray in the spirit when we pray in the spirit means pray in tongues you know the holy spirit reveals the mysteries um, that are to us re re reveals what we need to do in a specific situation in a specific problem that we are in a challenge that we are facing you know he reveals the thoughts the plans the purposes uh, for god to us so when you know you have to pray about something in your life, something that you don't know what to pray for exactly, or you're lost with words, you know, one good thing to do is to pray in the Spirit. Because when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit reveals the mysteries of God to us, reveals the plans and the purposes. And also, <clears throat> you know, uh, we can pray uh, aligned to God's will. Our will will be aligned to God's will. Okay, So praying in the Spirit aligns our will to God's uh, will okay uh look at what hebrews chapter 5 verses 7 to 9 says can somebody read that please hebrews 5 7 to 9 shall i sister yes go ahead lucy thank you who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with me with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. So it's very interesting that, you know, scripture says here in verse uh, 8 that the son learned obedience the son learned obedience uh, by the things he suffered okay so when when jesus himself learned obedience that means he learned to align his will to the father's will and we know this happened in the garden of uh, gethsemane matthew chapter 26 you know um when Jesus prays, Father, if it's your will, take this cup for me. Nevertheless, uh, let your will and not my will be um, <clears throat> done. Okay, so uh, 
he's aligning his will to the father's will when the son of man the son of god himself had to learn obedience how much more you and i and how much more i and you need to also align our will to his will okay so you know when we pray um, it changes us uh, prayer helps us to align our will to god's will okay and uh, how how does our will align to god's will when we pray because when we pray god works in our hearts you know and he brings our wills our desires and our dreams in alignment to his will to his plan and his uh, purposes okay so on the note of uh, praying in the spirit um, there's another beautiful verse from romans chapter 8 verses 26 and 27 can somebody read that for us, please. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Yes, Diksha, go ahead. Likewise, Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searched the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. Thank you, Diksha. So, uh, you know, even as we are praying, you know, um, when we pray in tongues, we know that it is the, the Holy Spirit that is pouring into our hearts. The language of the Holy Spirit that we are praying is originating from the Holy Spirit and it's accordance with his will. And it also helps us to you know, align our will to God's will. But also when we are, uh, you know, when we pray, uh, we do not know what to what we ought to pray for, but the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, is not somewhere, uh, you know, he, it says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness and the Holy Spirit himself makes intercession uh, for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's basically talking about you know, praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. But it does not mean that the Holy Spirit is praying somewhere far off, you know, uh, away from where we are. But it means that the Holy Spirit along with us, together with us, okay? Along with us, you know, together with us, uh, making known uh, the utterings and we are uh, saying it, whether it is whether it's groaning, whether it's weeping or crying, or whether it is words or speaking in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying alongside us and together uh, with us, uh, and He's making the intercession uh, for us. So that's another wonderful thing of the work of the Holy Spirit that He prays um, with us. Now, before we end this chapter. <clears throat> We are going to look at some lessons that we can learn about, uh, you know, how the Holy Spirit works or the how he births things uh, in us and the work of the Holy Spirit in us uh, through, uh, you know, um, the example of uh, Mary, even as, you know, she conceived to the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, and gave birth to baby uh, Jesus. So. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to learn some valuable lessons from this uh, 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 example of Mary's life and what God did in and through her life uh, to see how, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit gives birth to things in our, uh, in our lives and also how he works. It's very interesting. Uh, so we look at it. Okay. So there are several things about how, uh, you know, uh, or several ways or several um, uh, uh Things, how God releases the work of the Spirit through us uh, as human vessels. So this um, uh, life of Mary teaches us these several things on how God releases the work of the Spirit through us uh, human beings. The first one is that the work of the Spirit is released into the earth at an appointed time. Now, when do you think uh, first does God... Uh, you know, reveal his plan of redemption, of sending his son to the world. Anyone, any ideas? When was the first time that God revealed his plan of redemption, of sending his son into this world? When Adam and Eve sinned at the Garden of Eden. Yes, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, Genesis chapter 3, yeah. uh, you know, so we see that... Um, 
you know, uh, God says, I will put enmity between your, you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, so the he shall bruise is uh, Jesus would come and crush uh, the power and the authority of the evil one. Now, um, uh, we read in Galatians chapter 4. Can somebody read that, please? Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Amen. So it says here, when the fullness of time had come. Okay. So, uh, what was the time period between what God had revealed that he would send his son in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 uh, to the fullness of time when uh, uh, when Jesus came was 4,000 years. Imagine it for when God revealed his plan of sending his son to Jesus actually coming down on this earth um, as a, and being born as a baby, it took 4,000 years. Um, years. So, and we also read in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, that, you know, the fullness of time, you know, uh, the work of God was released on this um, earth. So, when God calls us to do some things and uh, he tells us ahead of time, you know, often it may take many years. Uh, we, all, we, we looked at uh, how many years God took for, uh, you know, Paul and David, uh, you know, almost uh, 17 years. Um, uh, also for Moses, we see, we, we studied this when we were looking at uh, fulfilling God's purpose for their lives from the time of their calling to the time, the preparation period to the time when they, the, the Kairos moment, the fullness of time when they got into their God appointed calling and their uh, purposes. So we see that, you know, even as God reveals things ahead of time, you know, often it takes many years for him uh, for to bring about what he has planned and purposed. Some Sometimes it can take lesser than a year. Sometimes it can take a year. It can take more than a year. Uh, but he releases his work at the appointed time. And we need to be patient with God for his appointed uh, time. Okay. And then the second thing we can learn from uh, this Mary's life and what God did is the work of the spirit is released through ordinary uh, people. OK, uh, we read in Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, the prophet Isaiah prophesies that a virgin shall give birth to a son, son, sorry, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. OK, so we see that uh, God chooses a, a small, insignificant, inexperienced virgin. Why do I say inexperienced? Because she had no experience in childbirth, in delivery. You know, but he just chose a small, little, insignificant, inexperienced virgin called uh, <clears throat> Mary. Okay. So you know, if we were have, we had to think from our point of view, our our logical reasoning, we could think, oh, God is taking a big, huge risk in you know getting uh, uh, an inexperienced virgin, a virgin, uh, to give birth to the Son of God. What if there is a miscarriage? You know, what if she doesn't take care of herself during her uh, pregnancy, you know? But we need to understand or look at it from God's perspective. We need to see it from God's viewpoint and from his perspective that, you know, when God is going to birth his plan and purposes in our life, the outcome is dependent on him and not on us. That does not mean that we sit back and are passive. No, we do what he's called us to do. We engage in the preparation time. Uh, we prepare ourselves. We eat, yield ourselves. We obey him. Uh, you know, we remove things, attitudes, and characters not aligning to his will. But, you know, the outcome is dependent on him, on God, and not on us. Only what he asked for us or what he asked of Mary and he, what he asked from us is our availability, our obedience, and our trust in him. And we see that Mary responded. Uh, she says, you know, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. Okay. So um, even as she was willing and submissive, God, you know, went about doing things in a supernatural way. And, you know, the outcome was dependent on uh, him. So God is not afraid 
of entrusting us simple, ordinary, insignificant people with the work of his no eternal kingdom. No audio? No, ma'am, it's coming. It's coming? Okay. It, it's audible, ma'am. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think there's something wrong with your... Uh, uh, sorry, Getrul, can you please check your... Uh, device? Others are able to hear me? Now yeah. I can hear, sister. <laughs> okay. Maybe there was a small glitch in your uh, in your device. Okay, we'll continue. Thank you. So God is not afraid in entrusting ordinary people with the work of his eternal kingdom. Amen. Are you excited about it? Amen. Yes, no? Yes. Thank you, Akil. Thank you, Deepu and Lucy. Okay. Thank you, Rupas and Vimal. So the work of the Spirit, uh, you know, even as he releases it, releases the work of the of uh, uh, his kingdom in and through us we need to know that the work of the spirit must be unadulterated it must be born purely of the uh, spirit it should not have anything to do with the work of the um, flesh okay so that is what we see in the life of Mary, the angel comes and tells her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you, overshadow you and the one that is to be born through you will be called the Son of God. So this is going to be a supernatural birth and it's going to be, uh, you know, through the power of the Holy um, Spirit, okay? So every work that God would release through us for his kingdom should be purely of his spirit. We've already studied about that. Um, so we'll move on, okay? And the work of the Spirit must be a uh, the work of the Spirit might be a cause of embarrassment, okay? Um, sometimes people will not understand us. People will think, hey, you know, you're being so foolish. You're leaving your high-profile job, your good salary, and you're going as a missionary. You're going as an evangelist. You're, you know, being a pastor. Uh, why are you doing it? Or you know. Um, you're leaving your uh, your job in, in another foreign country. You're going back to India, you know, and or you're going back to your home place and you're starting a ministry. What is wrong with you? You know, uh, it can sometimes, you know, uh, bring about uh, embarrassment. You know, people can laugh at you. People can make fun of you. Uh, but remember that, you know, when God calls us, uh, it's not something that we need to be embarrassed about. I remember when God called me into full-time ministry, um, there was a lot of emba embarrassment around that. Uh, embarrassment, why? Is because, you know, um, I remember when he called me when I was in 12th grade and I was preparing for my 12th exams and I wanted to know what to do after that. God called me into full-time ministry and I argued with him for a week. Uh, I wanted to do something professional and God was saying, I want you to go to full-time ministry. I want you to go to Bible college. And I was not, I knew I was not cut out for that. I was not ready for that. I never even thought I would be in that um, uh, you know, uh, in that sphere, or that place that God wants me to be. So I argued with God, but at the end of the week, I just wanted to end the argument. So I simply said, okay, God, but I didn't have any sense of commitment, passion, and I knew I'm not going to go to Bible college and full-time ministry, even though I was, you know, just in 12th grade, but I was also teaching in Sunday school at that time. So I told God, I will do something professional. Yes, Akil? I told God uh, that I'll do so. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Now, back then, you knew the calling was on teaching ministry, ma'am, or it, it took you time to realize what is the area of calling? No, it was, I didn't know it was teaching, um, preaching. Uh, well, my area is not teaching and preaching, my area is children's ministry. Um, but of course, God has given me the skill uh, to be a teacher as well. Uh, but it my calling specifically is for children's ministry. So I teach uh, children, um, but I also teach in a Bible college. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, so yeah, God called me into full-time ministry. Like I told you, he, he leads us step by step. So when I finished um, uh, my Bible college, he showed me which area of ministry I need to uh, be in. Okay. So it was a moment of embarrassment because I said, okay. And then I, I, I knew I would not be there. I just decided I won't be going to full-time ministry. 
after my 12th, I applied in uh, the best college in Bangalore. My sister was studying there. Um, she's a uh, she's someone who's very brilliant, and you know um, uh, she was a topper in in her BSc in that same college. So everyone knew her from the principal to the students. Um, so I knew I would get in there easily. But the third list came out. My name was not there. So my my sister when I spoke to the principal, he said, "Sorry, can't do anything." My father tried pulling strings. Nothing happened. It was an embarrassment because I had not applied anywhere else, and I had to stay at home for a year. I lost a year. So I remember going to the restroom and crying and saying, "God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know how embarrassing it is to stay at home for a year. What will people say?" And then God is saying, "Remember, you said you'll go to Bible college," and I was shocked. I I heard that very clearly, and I was way too shocked because I had forgotten about it. I told you I didn't have any sense of commitment and passion, and that's when I realized I better do what God is asking me to do. Um, uh, you know, I didn't know all of this theology then. I just you know things will be futile, things will not work out. You know, you need to position yourself in the right place. Blah blah. I did not know all that. Now I'm teaching that, so I know. But I just decided that you know let me. Just obey God. I, something just led me to obey Him. So I went into full time uh, ministry. But you know, my my father was kind of very upset with me because he thought uh, in those days, the nineties, way in the nineties, when people go into full time ministries, either they were failures, they did not have any other option in life to do anything else, so they landed up in uh, in, in theological or biblical colleges. Uh, thank God that mindset is not there today. It's a wrong mindset. So my father went and spoke to my pastor, and he. Uh, made things even more embarrassing for him. He said, "Why she wants to go to Bible college? Let her do some tailoring course, or let us do some teaching teachers course, so that she can teach." And that really upset my father because he's very professional minded, and he didn't want me to do anything like that. He was even more upset and angry, and he tried to get me into some college, even the even the most simplest and the worst college in Bangalore City. Nobody was taking me, and then he said, "You do what you want to do." You know, uh, it was a big embarrassment for a year. It was more than a year. Uh, it was a year since I was staying at home. It was very embarrassing. So sometimes, you know, when uh, the the work of the Holy Spirit can cause embarrassment, you know, but uh, uh, you know, even in the case of Mary, you know, it's embarrassing. Imagine a virgin, you know, giving birth, uh, conceiving. Uh, who would ever believe a story that it was through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of the things what the angel said, or the angel even visiting her and all of those things? But we see that you know. Uh, God spoke to those who people who mattered the most. So God spoke to Joseph, and um, uh, you know uh, Joseph and spoke to her, her uh, uh, cousin Elizabeth, who confirmed that it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we see, you know, when it's a genuine work of God, the Holy Spirit is leading us. People may not understand, but God will raise up a select few who will understand us, and God will speak to their hearts. So it's important for us to stay around such people who will help and encourage us to press further with the work of God that He's releasing in and through us. So I remember, you know, the same church that I was worshiping in, the assistant pastor. Um, a very nice uh, man of God. He, you know, helped me to get admission into theological college. He told me everything. He prepared me, and uh, you know, he sent me. So that is what God can uh, do. So stay around people who will encourage you, and God will speak and raise up people who will understand you, even as He gives you that call. The next thing that we can learn is the work of the Spirit is released through normal, natural uh, process. You know. Um, even though the uh, conception in Mary's womb was a miracle, you know, we know that Mary had to carry uh, 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 baby Jesus for the full uh, term pregnancy, that is nine months, uh, you know. Um, so we can think and say, hey, it's a supernatural conception, the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, why did, uh, uh, you know, Jesus not be born the next day, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, then uh, he could have just grown up quickly and then you know he could have been uh, the messiah who he had to come to into this uh, world so you know even as uh, it was the work of the holy spirit it was supernatural mary had to 
engage in the normal natural process of pregnancy delivery so uh, what does that teach us it teaches us that when god initiates his work in us by his spirit we need to co-labor with god okay it's a natural process even though a supernatural intervention it's a natural process where we are learning things we are building ourselves we are preparing ourselves and even as we go about co-laboring with god in the preparation the pro process in the uh, you know in the execution of it in the kairos moment it will be done by the empowering of his grace and the holy uh, spirit but because it's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, it does not mean that, you know, we don't uh, have to make any sacrifices, we don't have to work hard, we don't have to plan, organize, manage things, uh, pers and persevere. We just sit back, rel relax, just press the grace button, and, you know, favor button, and everything just happens. No, you know, God does not work like that. Uh, he births things in us, but it requires a lot of our co-laboring, hard work, perseverance, sacrifice, sleepless nights, plan, organize, manage. And sometimes you can think, you know, hey, I come to Bible college, I thought it would be easier than other colleges here. I have to study so much, do this, do that. No, yes, that is uh, the work of kingdom building. Some of you thought, you know, being a pastor is easy. No, you know, it might be easy if you sit back and lay it back and do nothing. But for kingdom building, you know, it requires a lot of hard work. It requires hours of just sitting and working, uh, you know, sleepless nights, one after the other. Sometimes I think of myself, you know, hey, this is going like one after the other. It's endless. You know, there's no rest. Sometimes I'm working uh, nine, 10 hours, 11 hours sometimes. But this is kingdom building. This is what, you know, we need to do, you know, sacrifice, work hard, persevere and do what God has called us to uh, do. Okay. The next thing that we can learn from uh, Mary's life and the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit through her life is that we might encounter close doors, you know, um, until we reach God's appointed um, place. Okay. Now imagine the shock and the disappointment that Joseph and Mary would have uh, you know, had to face when they traveled all the way to Bethlehem. They thought, you know, this is a uh, son of God that they're giving birth to. There will be a big uh, inn, a big hotel that God would have made arrangements, but nothing was available. Can you imagine the shock and the discouragement and this disappointment, you know, when there was no room available anywhere? And, uh, you know, finally they had, she had Mary had to give birth to uh, the son of God in a cattle shed. And, you know, they might have thought, hey, is this real? You know, um, is this what uh, is, uh, is this really God's plan for our life? Joseph might be thinking, right, is, did I really, you know, hear the angel? Mary would have thought, did I really hear the angel? Uh, but the cattle shed um, was not something that they had envisioned as the birthplace for the son of God, but it was the place that God had chosen for the Son of God to be born that um, night. So we should not be discouraged when we face closed doors, you know, um, when we are attempting to, you know, birth the purposes of God in our lives, because uh, closed doors could simply mean God is directing us to the right place uh, where he wants us, wants to release his plan and purpose or what he is birthing in and through us. So what we need to do is keep moving till we arrive at the place where God wants his work to be released, okay? So I told you, like, you know, even when God wanted me to go to full-time Bible college, he closed every door. Even if there was a possibility for me to get into that college where my sister was studying, I don't see why there was anything that could have closed that door. I still don't see today. Now, my sister was good. She was a topper there. You know, she had um, a good, um, uh, 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 you know, credibility in that place. She was doing well. And uh, my marks were f fairly good. There's no reason why I should have been, uh, you know, uh, my name should not be on those lists. But it was God's doing, you know. So God closed that door so that, 
you know, he knows when I step in there, there will be no turning back. And so he opened the doors for me in the right college. I remember even when I went to Bible college, uh, there was an organization, a Christian organization. They said they'll sponsor me, my fees, my uh, tuition fees, my boarding, my uh, uh, boarding and lodging and my mess fees. But when I reached Bible college, uh, it's in the week time, they sent a letter saying that they'll only pay half my fees which was not something that they had told me before. And they said that as long as I, um, uh, you know, they, they sponsor me, that is for six years, that I'll have to work for them six years. And I was quite shocked because this, these terms were not told to me before I came to Bible college. And, you know, uh, just out of 12th grade, moving into Bible college, very young, I was quite upset and I just, you know, uh, I said, I just wrote back and said, no, I'm not interested in this because um, that's what I felt strongly in my spirit. I don't understand all of these things in, in those days because I did not know the person, the work of the Holy Spirit. I didn't grow up in a church where we were taught that. Um, and so, you know, um, I just told God, you brought me to Bible college very boldly. I told him, you brought me to Bible college. You take care of all of these things. Hands up, right? Surrender. And I know that God took care of me six years. I don't know who paid my fees, any of my lodging, boarding, tuition fees, mess fees, nothing. Um, I just knew I got reminders from the finance office. But at the end of that year, before I have to write my final exams, I never used to get any of those reminders. And I know it just paid off. And that really proved to my father that you know, I was some, not somebody who just went into Bible college because I was playing the fool. I wanted an easy way of life. But I just pursued God's uh, <clears throat> call. So when we face closed doors, you know, don't be upset, don't be discouraged because God is taking us to the right place where he's birthing things to us, moving things in and through us. Okay, we'll move on. The work of the spirit often has simple, humble beginnings. Imagine the savior of the world being born to a virgin, uh, to a simple woman, uh, being born in a manger, uh, rather than in a palace, in an animal, uh, um, in a trough where you feed animals. But we see that God releases his work in small ways, in small beginnings. The work of God uh, is uh, begins, uh, and it is, but it is, uh, has the potential in it to, you know, or it's designed, uh, or it has the capability, the capacity to impact the whole world. Amen. Uh, that's what we read in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my uh, spirit. Okay. So, uh, and also in Zechariah 4, 10, it says, you know, for who despises the day of small things. So do not despise the day of small beginnings. Remember, it's just a small seed. But the seed, if it's willing to yield, obey, to just fall in the ground and die, it can, you know, uh, uh, grow into a big tree where it can produce um, food, uh, fruit, and also, you know, shade for uh, people. So don't despise small beginnings. Don't think, oh, this did not come with great fanfare. I, the angel Gabriel did not come to speak to me. I didn't see a vision. Heaven did not open and God's plan did not come on a paper and all of those things. But sometimes God's work, really, he releases it in small ways, small beginnings, but as long as we are faithful, committed, good stewards in small things, he will raise us up to big, bigger things, right? Like we learn in the parable of the steward, okay? Uh, moving on, the work of the spirit has to be protected and nurtured. Now, just imagine, you know, if Mary gave birth to the baby Jesus, uh, what if what would have happened if she said, you know, I don't want to feed him, I don't want to take care of him, or bathe him. Anyway, he's the son of God, he can do things by himself, or the angels can come and take care of him. You know, that would have been foolish, you know. Uh, yes, he was the son of God, but Mary and Joseph had the responsibility, the God-given responsibility to take care, nurture, protect uh, him as uh, their parents uh, and as any parent would normally do. So every work on, uh, that God releases on the earth through us, you know, must be nurtured and protected uh, because it's a work of the Spirit it does not mean that we are not responsible for stewarding it well. We need to steward it well. And stewarding it well means putting a lot of time and effort, not making excuses, 
uh, not making, uh, you know, just giving something, just, you know, doing something for the sake of doing it, but doing with excellence because we are in the kingdom of uh, God. Okay. So I hope this speaks to us, even as, you know, you are studying the Bible college, you do your assessments, your assignments, you know, you're doing it with honesty, uh, credibility, whether you're doing a presentation, it was sad to see some of your attitude toward the presentation, but you know, we are responsible for stewarding things well. When we are responsible in small things, when God looks at how faithful, sincere, and you're doing with excellence your assessment, your assignment, or your presentation, you know, he knows he's going to set you up for greater things. So we need to be faithful in small things before God can raise us up for bigger things. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Akil. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Chapter 3? All of you know the song All Over the World? Anyone knows the song All Over the World? The Spirit is Moving? Yes. Yes. This is a very uh, uh, famous chorus that we sing in the Methodist church. Anyone else other than Akil is a Methodist, so he knows. Anyone else knows? All over the world, the spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it would be. Hallelujah. All over the world, there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Right here in this place, the Spirit is moving. Right here in this place, as the prophet said it would be, hallelujah. Right here in this place, there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the so even as God is moving, his revelation is being revealed and is moving us uh, to bring glory in his kingdom. Amen. Okay, we'll move to chapter 4. If there are no questions, chapter 4. Any questions? To chapter 3. Okay, we'll move to chapter four then. Uh, the nature of a God-given vision. Uh, well, all of these contents that are there in this chapter is also presented in fulfilling God's uh, purpose for our lives, the publication and receiving God's guidance. Um, so I will just quickly uh, mention things, but I will go through uh, the lesson, not that I will just overlook it, but I will mention it. But even as I do, it will just, you know, reiterate the things that um, I taught you in your first semester in, in, the, uh, in the first year. Okay. Now, um, uh, you know, uh, God speaks to us through visions and dreams, you know, um, uh, and when he speaks to us through visions and dreams, he reveals his uh, ideas, plans, and purposes and goals. And we know that even as we are in the last days, you know, uh, Joel in his prophecy, uh, and also we read the Joel's prophecy in Acts chapter 2, uh, where God says in the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream uh, dreams okay um, uh, it's not uh, by visions and dreams we not only mean the supernatural spiritual experience of God speaking to us through dreams when we're asleep or visions that we can see but it's also referring to the ideas plans goals strategies that the Holy Spirit births in his people so even as God gives you plan and a purpose he can give you the strategies the goals through visions and uh, dreams so uh, the visions and dreams are uh, ways through which god communicates or ways through which the spirit of god or the holy spirit god uh, uh, holy spirit communicates through us god's plans ideas goals strategies in our 
um, lives okay and through dreams and visions you know the holy spirit reveals to us god reveals to us what is his, his desire uh, for us uh, to execute on the earth or how he wants us to engage in kingdom building or how he wants us to extend his kingdom here on uh, earth so the dreams and visions that God gives us is pregnant, which means it's full, you know, it's ready, uh, it's awaiting uh, the kingdom plans and the kingdom purposes to be fulfilled in and through us in this time, in this season, in our generation here on um, earth. Okay, so our goal in this chapter is basically to understand how God imparts visions um, and how God takes us on this journey to see his vision fulfilled in our lives. And even as we carry out his plans and purposes of his kingdom, you know, this will enable us to walk uh, with God correctly and also be true kingdom uh, builders. Okay, so we're going to look at 11 insights concerning God uh, given vision. The first First one is that God given vision is a divine command and an authorization. Okay. Um, now, when God speaks to us through his vision uh, or God gives us a, 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 a vision, you know, it's a command for us to uh, obey. Okay. Um, it is something that we need to obey when he gives us a vision or a goal or a plan or a purpose for our lives. It is something that we need to uh, obey. And it's uh, something that we can be, uh, you know, bold and confident uh, and fearless to go about doing it because it is coming from God himself. He is authorizing it. And even as we go about doing it, you know, fearlessly with boldness, courage, and in confidence, uh, we can do that with boldness, courage, and confidence because we have God backing us up. We have this all-powerful God who is backing us up. So for every vision God imparts, you know, God is also or every uh, plan, purpose, goal, uh, that a strategy God is giving us, you know, uh, or when God gives us a specific vision for our lives, you know, he's imparting that to us. He's 100% committed to seeing that vision being fulfilled in our lives. Now, if that vision is not coming to pass, it's not being fulfilled, it's nothing other than our unwillingness or our disobedience or our, uh, uh, you know, unyieldedness, unsubmission to God's will and plan. But if we are yielded, submitted and willing, then nothing can stop us because God is 100% committed to seeing his vision uh, fulfilled. Okay. Um, yes. Yes, Akil. Uh, in the case of Joanna, though he relented of uh, what God had told him, but still God ensured he had his way out. So would that not be also applicable in our lives at times when he calls us and assigns us a task and we don't adhere to it, will he still not have his way out? Uh, yes, in in the in the uh, in Jonah's life, uh, we see that even though you know uh, Jonah was uh, uh, you know uh, uh, unwilling, he you know he went to down to Joppa, then went to took a ship to Tarshish, uh, and they threw him overboard, and you know uh, he cried out to God, you know he he asked for forgiveness, he uh, and you know that is when God. Uh, cause that uh, you know the uh, the whale to vomit him on the shore okay and then god gives him the call the second time and he goes uh this time he obeys and goes so it's not that god was forcing it down his throat or you know pushing it down or you know telling him you have to go but you know J jonah also came around came to that point where he was willing to go but even if he if he was not willing to go then second time and god told him he would have still disobeyed right he wouldn't have gone or he would have said god you know uh, take my life let me die here in this uh, uh, in this uh, 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 the belly of this fish but he prayed and he cried out to god right right yes so would i be right in saying suppose if god calls me for a mission and i don't adhere to it if it is not me he will any which way accomplish his mission through somebody else after giving me a couple of chances or so, would that be right in saying so? Yes, God would extend his kingdom irrespective of what the person, uh, uh, whether the person is willing or not. Like Pharaoh was hard-hearted and stubborn in spite of that 
God went ahead and uh, did it, you know. But Moses, you know, uh, we read that Moses got put in his heart, you know, and he knew in his heart he was called uh, to liberate his people, but he took things in his own hand and it, uh, you yeah. know, delayed things for 40, uh, 40 years. And the age of 80, God called him at the burning bush, right? Uh, okay. But he was willing to go after that. So God still gives us uh, second chances, but does not mean that when we are not willing that, you know, it all comes to a standstill. God can still, you know, raise up other people to further his plans and purposes and extend his kingdom. But he still waits for you to come around and to, you know, be involved in the plan and purpose that he has for your life. Amen. Uh, so when God gives us a vision, the person who has a vision is called the vision bearer. Okay, so when God wants to execute something on the earth, he usually raises up a person. Okay, uh, you know, God does not um, work in isolation. He always uh, works uh, in partnership with his people in fulfilling his plan and purpose here on the earth. So he raises a person in a certain place and he gives them a certain message and he stirs up, you know, uh, the heart of people around him to come together to fulfill the purpose and the plan that he has laid on that specific person. So there can be different people who can come alongside you, walk alongside you to engage with you in fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your uh, life. Like I know, you know, after uh, Bible college, uh, you know, a couple of years later on, God led me to uh, start a new project for teens and, you know, um, there was another girl who got brought about and, you know, she was uh, an expert in social work. So she knew how to write projects and this and that. So God used us both to start this project and God brought other people to work in a project that we had uh, initiated that we had started. And I remember when I came to um, APC 2008. Again, God led me to start a new project because I joined uh, to minister to children. There was no children's ministry done in, among schools. So God, uh, you know, uh, helped me to initiate a project called Catalyst. And I know that God has brought so many people uh, to work in Catalyst, to minister um, uh, in Catalyst to children in school. So when God birth something in you, he'll also bring about people uh, to help you fulfill God's plan and purpose because to God, God does not have things in mind for us that we work in isolation, always together in community, uh, together with other people. So when God raises a man, uh, you know, or a woman, uh, um, uh, and he gives them a specific a mission to fulfill his purpose here on the earth, uh, and God gives them a message or gives them a, a ministry as well, then that man or that woman becomes a vision holder or the vision bearer among the people and God also entrusts them the methods that they should use uh, the means that they need to use to carry out to fulfill God's divine plan and uh, purpose okay so we look at a couple of examples one of them is Moses we read in Acts chapter 7 verses 17 to 36 uh, about Moses but specifically verse 23 says that when he was Moses was 40 years old it came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of um, Israel okay so we see that when God births something in our lives, it is through a simple steering uh, of our hearts uh, through which he stirs his vision uh, that he wants for our lives. So we see that, you know, um, in this instance, uh, when he was 40 years old, God just, you know, through a simple steering in Moses's heart, he births his purpose uh, that he wants to uh, use him to free the children of um, is right. But God can also, you know, uh, speak in supernatural ways to reveal his plans and uh, purposes to get our attention. Uh, so we see that, you know, uh, when Moses was 80 years old, we see that the burning bush, you know, um, uh, uh, God attracts his attention and God's presence was there. 
And uh, when Moses saw that, he goes and God calls him uh, again, you know, to fulfill his vision. So sometimes a vision can come as a simple stirring in our uh, hearts while God does speak in supernatural ways to reveal his plan and purposes. But we also need to know that can come in simple stirring in our hearts like it did for the first time in uh, Moses's uh, life. And then sometimes he just captures our heart. He tries to get our attention, uh, you know, like he uses the burning bush uh, to get the attention of uh, Moses, okay? Um, so the thing that gets uh, our attention, like he uses a supernatural, you know, uh, is often the place where God's presence is and where God's voice can be released uh, to this, you know, to where he speaks to us uh, to give us our call and our destiny that he has for uh, us. So we see that, you know, Moses encountered God, the simple stirring in his heart. In Acts chapter 7, verse 28, he just knew in his heart. And that birth about his plan and his purpose. So God can do that in our lives as well. Okay. So we'll stop here. Any questions? It's time. Anyone has any questions? Sister, uh, I want to say something mm -hmm. that uh, I have personally experienced that only when my relationship in prayer is very intimate with God, that's the time I have seen visions, dreams, and I have uh, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Intimacy with God births, you know, uh, the manifestation of the gifts. Yes. And also we can hear God speaking because we are desiring what he wants to desire and he speaks to us. You know, because we are desiring to do what he wants us to do and be led by him. Yes. Anyone else? Thank you, to get Uh just want to say that next week, uh, we are all off to uh, youth missions. All of our in-person Bible college students are going to a youth missions trip and all of us as pastors will be speaking at the youth camp, um, uh, youth missions uh, at uh, in Hyderabad. So we will not have um, uh, uh, online class next Wednesday, but I will post uh, two hours of lecture. Uh, the lecture videos will be on, so please listen to the lecture videos. Is that fine? Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, sister. It's only next Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I'll um, and see you week after next. Please listen to the lectures uh, that is posted for next week, and I hope you listen to the lectures uh, that I posted um, uh, uh, last week. The extra two lectures. Okay. If you've not, please listen to that. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. God bless you.